You know, it seems that uh, everywhere you look nowadays, there is an ever-increasing amount of chaos and hostility and division um, wherever you're looking. Uh, we see it within families. We see husband and wife dividing, chaos, conflict, turmoil. We see parents and kids, chaos, conflict, turmoil, division. Um, we look in um, work environments and uh, people are separating, divided, conflict, turmoil. Certainly you watch the news, read the paper now, and you see that race and racism is just a very emotionally charged conversation. You see sociodemographics pitting against one another where people find themselves more in us versus them conversations. You see, even within churches, churches on hot topics, it could be same-sex marriage, it could be a number of different topics, and churches and denominations are pitting against one another. You just see division running rampant seems to be everywhere. And unfortunately, the more we watch, the more it appears, at least, that it's increasing and that it's uh, going to continue to get worse and worse is what it appears to be. And the real challenge with that is, it was never intended to be that way. God never intended for it to be that way. He, he gave the instruction to his disciples about himself and then instructions for them that we're to be light in the world and we're to be salt in the earth. He embodied, he taught, and he gave the command to love one another and to carry that out and live that out in such a way that it impacted community and even beyond that. For the next uh, six, seven weeks, we're going to be in a series that we're entitling, We're Better Together. We're Better Together. And I really sincerely feel that this is a very important series for our church, and not just so much for what you and I might take away and drive home and how we apply it in our marriage or how we apply it at our residence but also that our community needs us to hear this message. Because if there's ever an entity that has been given the command and the opportunity and the instruction for exampling and leading the way as to what does it look like to love one another and to create grace and to build relationships, it would be the church of Jesus Christ. And so over the next six, seven weeks, we're going to be diving into a number of topics of what it looks like being together with one another and being the light of the world, being the salt of the earth, and impacting not just our homes, but impacting our community here in this area. As we get started, I think it's very appropriate for us to pray and ask God's blessing, not just on our talk this morning, but the entirety of this series. And inside of that, I'm going to ask you, as you're praying with me, to make a commitment that you're going to join me for as many of these weeks as you possibly can, can be at in order for us to make this journey together and see God use us as a church uh, to really be light in this community. So if you'll pray with me. Uh, Father, we, right now we just come before you and we've prayed a few times this service, but we bring specifically this series to you and we open our hearts and our minds to you. We do not want to start with our own opinions. We do not want to start with our own comfort. We want to start with who you are. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us, not just today, but over the coming weeks, as to what it looks like to be light in the world and salt in the earth and to be one that helps the body of Christ connect and walk in a place of unity. So speak to us today and speak to us over the coming weeks. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Amen. Um, you know, if we look at the early days of the church, earliest days of the church, we will see that, um, that following the resurrection and following the ascension, they had come to this place of recognition that along with believing, they were required to connect. That part of their calling was not to just simply believe something in their brain, or in their heart, but to also have a connection that ends up happening. Um, we see this early church where the disciples are going to lead the way. 
Um, they are a ragtag group of people. They have connected with one another. They probably did not know each other very well before they made their connection. I think you can make a strong case for some of the disciples that they didn't know each other at all beforehand. And for three years, they're going to journey together. They're going to get to know one another. They're going to have some men fighting. They're going to have some rivalry, competition. Jesus is going to depart from them. They're going to be given the instructions that they're supposed to go carry this mission out. They become aware from Jesus' own words that this is going to be a hostile environment. This is going to be a very dangerous thing that they're going to go into. And they still found a way to stay unified. And as they reached more and more people, these people would connect with the early church. And even though there was the fear and the threat of danger on the outside, they still continued to galvanize and connect on the inside. And we see a couple of snapshots in the book of Acts where it displays what this looked like for them. In Acts chapter 2, it says this, that they, dis- they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, stop right there. We all know, or most of us know, that we've been in a seven-week series. We're just coming out of it. Seven weeks of calling on God. Seven weeks of saying, God, what do you want to do in my life? We're here before you. We're calling out for your purposes. And that's not just that I get a better job or that, get, that I get a, more, a bigger home or we sell the home or any of that. God, use my life in whatever way. That's what we've been praying. And that's what the disciples were praying. And following that, they're connecting. And it says in verse 43, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, when it says everything in common, it's not saying that they agreed on everything, that everybody, when they said, what's for dinner, everybody said the same thing, you know? I've, I've got a family of six, four kids, and when we say, what do you want for dinner? We get four different opinions. We, it's like, come on, really? One night, same thing, you know? It, When it says that they shared in common, it's that they all had their own opinions, but they were willing to acquiesce. They were willing to put the greater good, the whole, in front of themselves. And it says that uh, selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. I love that statement there, glad and sincere hearts. They came together together. And they were glad and sincere. If you're in church world for long enough, you'll watch that people will attend church as long as they're glad and sincere. And the minute they're not glad or they don't feel sincere, they abandon, whether it be church or abandon relationships. I pull out the minute I'm not glad. I just didn't feel it. As though glad and sincere is the prerequisite to connect with God and his family. That was not the case in the early church. It wasn't whether they were glad or sincere. They were going to connect with the church. And because they connected with the church, they were therefore glad and sincere. And they have these glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. We see another snapshot in Acts chapter 4. It records very similar context. It says all the believers were one heart, one in heart and mind. That's an amazing thing, one in heart and mind. Not Once again, not that they agreed on everything, but they were willing to say this is the target. This is what God wants to do within this people. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and was distributed to anyone as he had need. You think about these contexts. You know, I don't know about you, but when I read Acts 2 or Acts 4, I think I'd love to live in that. You know, look at what's going on in the world and the division, the chaos, the hostility, the turmoil. You post something on Facebook and you're going to have a multiple of wolves chasing you down. You know, what, what, what does it look like to live amongst a community that is together, that recognizes we are better together? You know, this idea that we see in Scripture, this idea that we see in the New Testament of the disciples following a time of prayer The agenda of God was oneness. And it's really important for us to understand this today. 
there, as we look back at the last seven weeks, I think we were all clear. God was calling us as a church into a time of calling on him. A number of us were fasting at points during the seven weeks. I say, God, what do you want for us? And I think the agenda for us, as much like it was for the early church, I want to see unity in you. I want to see oneness of purpose, oneness of agenda. It doesn't mean we agree on everything, but oneness, that we can put his purposes and his agenda ahead of our agenda, that we're not trying to get him to serve us, but we're here to serve you and see your kingdom come and your will be done. Oneness embraced. And that oneness, that concept of oneness, did not start with the disciples. That concept of oneness reaches all the way back into the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, where God is going to form Eve. We know that Genesis chapter 1 is the telling of creation. And then Genesis chapter 2 is a more detailed explanation of that creation. And he's going to say of Adam, he's going to look at Adam and say, something's not good here. It says in verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And the women would say, amen, he will mess things up. You know, I will make a helper suitable for him. He needed it. Your joker that you live with, he needs that help. Absolutely. Um, he goes on to tell the story of how God caused Adam to be in a deep sleep. And God takes this rib from him and fashions Eve and then awakes Adam and presents Eve to Adam. He gives very little instruction on that, you know. And uh, they're going to have this relationship. And he's going to go on to talk about what this looks like, the agenda, it says, the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, stop right there. You got to remember this as you look at this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. Adam had no father and mother. Eve had no father and mother. It's not so much that he's depicting what happens for them. He's depicting this is going to be the union. This is going to be the process. There's a one flesh. There's a oneness that God desires within relationships. And if this were some kind of movie that we were watching, you know, there would be real soft lighting. There would be some kind of romantic music. If it was a movie that you were watching, you would squeeze her, your wife's hand. You would cuddle close. You would eat popcorn together. But then in chapter 3, that music turns. If this was a movie, that music turns. It becomes a little more sinister. The lighting goes from soft blues to sharp reds. And the serpent enters into the story. And we know that the serpent is going to tempt Eve. He's going to tempt Adam. They're going to sin. They're going to break relationship with God. Instantly, they go into what we talk about, shame or guilt and blame. They blame one another, and then they're going to try and cover their shame. And they hide from the Lord, and they accuse one another. And that spills over into chapter 4. That same sinister feel and music carries over into chapter 4, into their children, where Cain and Abel are going to be set against one another. Abel's going to present a sacrifice to the Lord. Cain's going to be jealous of God's response to it. And he's going to seek out the death of his own brother. And there's a fracturing of relationship. The idea of oneness is broken within Adam and Eve. And it's broken within Cain and Abel. That takes you into Genesis chapter 5. And the human race is spider webbing. People... Families, communities are growing. Chapter 5 talks about how the earth just begins to be populated. And then that takes you into Genesis chapter 6. And the sinister music is continuing because wickedness and depravity is running rampant. There's fracturing of relationships everywhere. And God says, I've got to stop this. And he says to Noah, I want you to build a boat because I've got to bring judgment against this. And he does bring judgment, and he wipes out everybody except for Noah and his family. The problem is the judgment did not eradicate sin because this brokenness is still inside of them. So immediately brokenness starts again. And from that page on through history, you see chaos and conflict and turmoil and division, people pitting one against another. And Jesus, 
would eventually come onto the scene some 3,000 years later and he would live in a way that was very different and he would teach in a way that was very different. So much so that his disciples, when he would call them, would be so greatly impacted. They would watch his life and listen to his words and following his death and resurrection and ascension back into heaven, they would then go on to write the gospels, the retelling of his story and the The disciple John would think back on how Jesus lived, and he starts John chapter 1 with this description. He says, in him, being in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. And this light, it shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Inside of him was love, inside of him was grace, inside of him was embrace, and the darkness didn't understand it. He lived for 30 years before starting a ministry and then carried a ministry out for about three years. He pours into the disciples and while he's at the edge, the door of being prepared to give his life for for humanity, he prays and he prays for the disciples and not just the disciples but for anybody that would respond to the message of the disciples. He prayed for you and he prayed for me in John 17. And he says this in John 17, verse 20, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. If I could stop right there for just a moment. I get that you and I in a season of calling on God, we're asking for favor. We're asking for better teachers for our kids. We're asking for better grades. We're asking for better friends in their lives. We're asking for promotions. We're asking for a lot of different things, and I understand that. But Jesus' prayer says, I'm praying that they would be one. And he gives a description of what that would look like. He says, I pray that they may be one, Father, just as, just as you are in me and I am in you like I look at our relationship, and I pray that they have the joy of experiencing oneness just as we have. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May they experience what we experience just as. This oneness that we get to experience just as you are in me and I am you. May they also be in us so that. And we talked in our series calling on God about those so that prayers. Jesus prays a so that prayer. When you and I are praying for blessing, what is the so that? I pray that you'd bless my family so that fill in the blank. I pray that you'd bless my kids and give my kids opportunity so that fill in the blank. Don't just stop with the front side. Fill in the blank of the so that. Jesus fills in the so that. So that. So that the world may believe. May believe that you have sent me. I have given them, he says, I have given them the glory. Now stop right there. I have given them the glory. Now what are we talking about with glory? Glory is the manifested presence of God that you are able to see God for who he truly is. If God displayed his full glory and did not filter us, in the Old Testament people could not live in the midst of the full manifested glory of God. Jesus is talking about the capacity to see God, the capacity to behold God. I have given them the capacity to behold God. You say, how does that happen? In the New Testament, it says that if you've seen Christ, you've seen the fullness of God. You've seen the fullness of deity. Just as I represent that, they've been able to see that. And I'm praying that they would be one so that the world would be able to see God clearly. And he gave them this glory that you gave me, it says here, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You know, when you and I pull away from our scenarios and we pull away from news channels and we pull away from all the chaos in the world and we pull away even from the scriptures and evaluate, we've got to understand that one of the byproducts of believing in Christ is not just a head knowledge and not just an acknowledgement, yeah, I believe that's probably true, but there are characteristics that have to be displayed in our lives, characteristic that he wants to form inside of each one of us. 
We only have a couple of fill in the blanks today in your notes, but here's two fill in the blanks. The characteristics of believing in Jesus is a love for the outside world and a unity for the inside family. Then my heart grows more and more for people that don't know him, more and more for people that are lost, that are confused, that are running through life without hope, without aim, without purpose. I have a love that grows for the outside world. And then I'm also to have this growing sense of unity for the inside family. It's not that the pastors and the leaders and the board and everybody agrees with my concept. But I want to walk in unity so the church family is that place, that oneness that the world can come into or see, brush up against and say, I really have seen God through what I've seen in these people becomes a powerful thing, becomes a powerful thing. And it's not about my car. It's not about my square footage. It's not about my job. Although the scriptures invite us to talk to him about those things, that overarching oneness, unity, common purpose is that we would walk in a unity with one another. That you're my brother. I'm your brother. We're family. We're the family of God. And what does it look like for us to walk in unity together? It's certainly in a world and in a time where chaos and division is just popping up everywhere. This was not only true for Jesus, this was not just an ideological concept that you would say, yeah, that sounds good, let me get my car, drive home into reality. The Apostle Paul lived this out. The Apostle Paul experienced this. The Apostle Paul was on one extreme in that he persecuted the church in a way that you and I never would. You and I might disagree with the church. He began killing people within the church. And God took him from that extreme to become the greatest spokesman of the church. And as he reveals and looks back on his life, he makes some statements in multiple letters about what it looks like to be in unity with one another. One of those examples comes from Ephesians chapter 4. He's writing to a church in a town called Ephesus. And he says this, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort. Stop right there for a second. Make every effort. How many efforts? Every effort. Make every effort. We're, in a few weeks, we're going to push on a talk around this every effort concept. He would use that same phrasing to uh, the church in Rome. In Romans 14, 19, he would say, make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Make every effort to do whatever brings about the unity of the church. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit, he says here, through the bond of peace. Now, if we were to stop right there real quick, that term unity came from a Greek word, a hanotes. And um, this term meant oneness. It was this idea of oneness. What does it look to have oneness? Not just separation, not just opinions, but oneness. And he's going to build on that concept of oneness by displaying a lot of one things in the church. He says this, following that, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This idea of unity is not, guys, it is not that we're all going to agree on everything. It's not that if we put up a question, we're going to have, you know, uh, 500 of the same answers. It's this idea that we are willing to separate from our agendas and focus on the same purpose and the same cause. What is that? We become one so that the world might behold him and recognize that he loves them and he died for them and gave his life for them and that they could experience new life. For that cause, we walk in a oneness with one another. And not only is that the agenda of God, one of the amazing things inside of that is there is a strategy for God, of God inside of that to bless you and to bless me. When he wants to bless you and he wants to bless me, often he'll draw us into a place where there's unity because he blesses unity. 
There are a lot of times that he won't bless disunity, but if he sees unity in the marriage, or he sees unity in the community, or he sees unity within the church, he blesses it. For instance, in Psalm 133, this is what it says. In Psalm 133, it says here, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. The writer here is just reflecting on the people of God coming together for sacrifice, and there would have been a unity, there would have been a oneness there, this one representation. And he's saying that unity, that unity is incredibly important. And then it says, it's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord commands his blessing, even life forevermore. You think about you and me, if we're going to say yes to Christ, if you and I are going to say yes to Christ in our life, then that means we're going to pursue him. And if we're going to pursue him, then he's going to work inside of us. And if he is going to work inside of us, then he is going to transform us to be more like him, set towards his agenda, set towards his purpose. And his purpose and his agenda is that you I would be part of a fellowship, would be part of a community, that we grow in our faith with one another, that we worship our Savior, and that we live in context with one another in such a way that if anybody brushes up against you or brushes up against us, they would say, ha, I've seen God. I've seen how that looks. I've seen how they relate so that the world might know and believe. You think about this question. This is a question I've been wrestling with this week. How do you know where you need unity? Like it'd be real easy to just say, well, we need unity everywhere. How do you know where you need unity? And I was thinking in context to Psalm 133, and I think you can answer that question with another question. Wherever I need unity, you could ask the question, well, where do I need God's blessing? Because if God blesses in the presence of unity, then if I have unity there, I'll have the blessing of God there. So follow me here. Let's make it in our world for just a second, your private world. I need the blessing of God in my marriage. Sometimes the marriage is good. Sometimes the marriage is stale. Sometimes the marriage is fun. Sometimes it's rocky. But we need the blessing of God. And it's easy to want to pray for the blessing of God, but what you and I could do is say, if we pursue the unity, make every effort to protect the spirit of unity by the bond of peace, he commands a blessing in that environment. How do I get the blessing of God in my home with my kids and my relationships? Unity. That is not my agenda. I'm dad. Get out of my chair. I'm dead. Give me the remote. I'm dead. But we walk in unity for the greater whole, the greater good. I need God's blessing at work. How do I walk in unity there? I promise you, if you start asking that question, the Holy Spirit will give you a lot of wisdom on that. How do we see the blessing of God as a church in our community? In the midst of division, I assure you, you know this. You know this. You don't need me to say it. In the next month, hostility, division, choosing lines, choosing side, it's going to get a little worse. How do we as a church influence in that environment? How do you and I stand and be light in our world and have the blessing of God? Unity. It reminds me of this idea that sometimes in our world, people tend to think that fighting somehow will lead to blessing. If I fight more, it'll lead to blessing. I don't know if you uh, used to ever read or come across those Peanuts cartoons, but there's one Peanuts cartoon where Lucy comes into the room, Linus is in there, Linus is watching TV, and she tells him to give him the remote, give her the remote, and Linus basically in the cartoon says, well, why should I give you the remote? And she doubles up her fist, and she says this, this is the line she uses, these five fingers, individually they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. (laughs) To which Linus responds, which channel do you want? (laughs) 
And then what's funny is the next frame of the cartoon, he's looking at his hand, and the caption says, why can't you guys get organized like that? <laughs> you know, in our, in our culture, at work, in our homes, with our kids, with our spouse, it's easy to think that the one who can do this will win. And we can be over here saying, why can't you guys get organized? Why can't I fight better? I wish I could debate her better. I wish I could challenge them more. I wish I would fight my way through this. The blessing of God, more times than not, you're not going to find it from this. You're going to find it from a sense of unity, of walking in peace within your home. He might be wrong. She might be wrong. You might have difference of opinion. But what does it look like in your marriage to walk together in unity? We're going to be talking over the next six, seven weeks. We're better together. You're better together with your spouse. Not this, but God bring unity into our home. You're better together. Not so much where kids are in their own room, doors closed, and we're all fighting. But what does it look like for us to come together as a family unified? We're better together as a church family when we're coming together, not so much my way, this is what I like, these are the songs, this is the order, I want to park there, you know. But understanding we're better together, we're better together. Let me protect the unity that God is bringing within a church to make a difference in our community. And my prayer today is that you will respond and you will be open and you will be with me for the next six, seven weeks. As we ask God, God speak to us, what do you want us to do as a church family for this community in this very important season that we're in? So all across the room, I want to say a prayer for us, and I'd like to have you join me. And uh, as we're praying, right where you are, I would invite you, challenge you to make a commitment. Make a commitment to say, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Father, this morning, we come before you. And Lord, we could all agree we need your blessing in our lives. Uh, we're grateful for um, jobs and provision from jobs, but our blessing comes from you. We're grateful for a home that we're able to live in, the ability to put gas in a car. We're grateful for all that, but our blessing comes from you. And uh, we pray today that you would help us to walk in a unity in our lives at home with our community, with our church. Help us to walk in a way of grace and love. Help us to be light in this season. And for our church, for our church, I pray that you would help us walk in a oneness so that this area, Wesley Chapel, New Tampa, Dade City, would be able to see you and say, I've seen God, and that they would put their faith in you. Jesus, we love you so much, and we offer ourselves to you. This morning, with every head bowed, eyes closed, maybe you're here today, and you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You know about him, but you don't know him. But this morning, if that's you, and you say, Joel, I do want to know the Lord. I'm not here by accident. If you'll pray this prayer with me, the Bible talks about believing in our heart, confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, then we shall be saved say this all the time, it's not the words, it's the faith behind the words. So this morning, if you're here today, say, I don't have a relationship with the Lord, but I want to, or maybe you're just coming home, you've been away for a while, you're coming home, just pray this prayer and say, Jesus, today, I give my life to you. By faith, I acknowledge that you love me, you came for me, died for me. That my sins could be forgiven and that I could experience new life, eternal life and new life here. So I offer myself to you from this day forward, be my Lord and my leader in Jesus' name. Father, today as your people go, would you bless them in an amazing way. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to dismiss you in just one second.
Today, if you're new with us, I and some of the staff will be down front. We'd love to shake your hand if you don't have to get out too quickly. Number two, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we have ushers at the doors. They'll have a Bible. They'll have some materials. I'd love to give you if you'll just let them know, hey, I prayed that prayer to receive Christ. They'll be able to help you out. We want to be a blessing to you. Last thing that I'm going to say before I dismiss you, parents, if you have students in junior high, high school, please Please bring them out. It's going to be a powerful worship time. I spoke last Wednesday. I'm going to speak for just a short bit tonight. I'll be speaking with the youth again next Wednesday. I would love to have them here. We're talking about what does it look like as a teenager to really pursue God. This is an important night for us. And so if you can make whatever concessions, changes to your schedule to make sure they're here for 6 to 7, 7.30, uh, it would just be a real blessing for them and for our church. With that said, guys, have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.